Well, good morning, everyone. We're starting to look a little more like a pre-midterm class here. <laughs> I think all of my classes are a little <coughs> thinner this week than they usually are. So what we're going to do today is talk about the career of a particular individual of, uh, s of special importance in Gandhi's entourage, so to speak, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, whose name and, name and dates are up on the board here. And I don't think it's going to take us our whole time to discuss his history and the significance of it. So we can get started with some review stuff uh, in a little while. And I'm going to follow the old uh, standby, the formula that they tell you for writing a successful paper. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them that you told them. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start right away by telling you what I think is the main kernel that I'd like us to get out of this story and that uh, this one man in his lifetime without planning to managed to give the lie to four myths about nonviolence. So there are four very common disbeliefs about nonviolence. If you uh, look in Wikipedia, you'll find them right there. <laughs> and uh, this, the career of this one person which we're going to go over in a little bit, uh, shows you that these four things are not true. So the first myth is that nonviolence only works against a weak opponent. And that's a serious uh, problem in the field because What it basically means is that nonviolence is a weak force and it depends on the other person not putting, much mu not putting up much resistance. But of course that nonviolence is a weak force or that it's no force at all is part of the old paradigm. That's exactly what we've been trying to uh, overthrow or at least show an alternative to in this whole time and of course in our whole semester together. So if you – once you understand that nonviolence is a force, you're on your way to understanding that it really is the paramount force. And the Gandhi said it's the greatest force at the disposal of humanity. So obviously it will not depend on the uh, condition of the opponent at all, much less that the opponent is weak and undetermined. And uh, let's see, do we have it in our reader? There is an article that usually I assign for next semester by Ralph Summey called Nonviolence and the case of the extremely ruthless opponent. Because if, if, if you have a regular fight and both opponents are using the same means, the one that has more of it wins, right? If you know they have ten guns and you have only eight guns, they're going to outshoot you. But if they have ten guns and you decide to use nonviolence, it's an entirely different equation. And at that point, the more violent your opponent is, the easier it may be to overcome him. That's why in the very early days when a, an American scholar named Richard Gregg, who was a pacifist, when he went to India and visited Gandhi, came back and wrote a book about it, a term that they were using often in those days, the 30s, was moral jujitsu. Moral jujitsu, because it's neither moral nor jujitsu, but that's okay. The point of jujitsu was that it's a, in all Japanese martial arts, as far as I know, if somebody the f – the stronger and the more vehemently someone jumps on you, the easier it is to overcome them because what you're doing is you're using their energy against them. So in that respect, it resembled what nonviolence was like. And we're going to see a very pointed example of that in a bit when we're looking at the civil rights movement because Martin Luther King – was brilliantly successful against stupid, pig-headed authorities <laughs> who were dumb enough to beat him in public, you know, especially beating children. That was very effective and useful. But ev uh, on one occasion at least in Albany, Georgia, he comes up against somebody who's smart enough to know that this doesn't work and he only arrests you very politely. And in fact, this is what happens in Washington, D.C. In our country today, if you do protesting or you try to enter the White House lawn or something like that, they're very polite to you in that city because they know there's a lot of press coverage and this would give the wrong image. So 
Um, the, the assumption that we would usually have that the more brutal the opponent is, the more impossible it will be to overcome them by nonviolence is the reverse of the truth. Of course, it may mean that if they're really brutal that you're going to have to have uh, a lot of suffering in your path before you can overcome them. Uh, Gandhi, I think I told you on Tuesday, he was asked, "Will the uh, what? How would how could you use nonviolence to overcome the Nazis?" And he said, "Not without a lot of pain." So yeah, it may hurt, but that may make your victory all the more assured. So uh, what the story of the Patans, uh, this, these people, the old spelling was Patans. This is sort of a anglicization. They're actually – today we mostly call them Pachtun or Pashtun or Pushto or something like that. But this is a more or less clearly demarcated ethnic and cultural community which uh, is pretty much coterminous with uh, Afghanistan. So th these are the people whom the Soviets were not able to conquer, but that's actually the second myth. So let me get let me stick with the first one. If you read the story, which we'll be looking at in a little while, of the British behavior in the Northwest Frontier Province, Northwest Frontier Province, you will see that the gloves were off. The British were extremely violent in the Northwest Frontier. And that's tragic, but it does show us that because nonviolence was as successful there as it was anywhere else, that shows us that nonviolence is not limited to working against a uh, weak opponent, on the contrary. Uh, Julia, I think there's one right there. So the second myth. Again, we'll be getting back to these in a bit that the person offering nonviolence has to be in a some sense or another gentle. And that's not entirely wrong, but it can be exaggerated and people can think that in order to be nonviolent, you pretty much have to be a wimp. You know, you pretty much have to eat quiche and drink decaf and all these sort of slightly less than fully human attributes. Um, or maybe you're even from California and you're an avocado eater. That's what they call us in the rest of the country. Uh, and again, this is an inference that grows out of this idea that nonviolence is not a real power. All you're doing is saying, I will not be violent. But if there were any, was anyone that gives a lie to this, it was the Patans. They had, as you've known from <coughs> From looking through the book, this is the book that you just finished, by the way. <laughs> Very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is uh, no one was less wimpy than the Patans. They're still not at all wimpy. Um, uh, they, you know, you know, the revenge ethic. This book, this book tells the whole story. Climactically, on an, on in the late 30s, when and early 40s when a lot of Hindus were saying this isn't going to work. And you have Subhash Chandra Bose, this famous uh, – he was called Netaji, the leader. He was actually advocating open warfare against the British to the extent that he even went to Germany and met Hitler. Um, he, he and people like him were starting to collect uh, impatient Hindus who hadn't seen enough progress from all of their – struggle and suffering in the 30s, early 30s. And uh, the Patans were still completely nonviolent. And Abdul Ghaffar Khan actually said to Gandhi, how is this? You know, you Hindus are supposedly be the nonviolent people. We Muslims are violent. Now look, at it's the reverse. And Gandhi said, yes, we Hindus have always espoused nonviolence, but we have not always been brave. You Patans have always been brave. And so therefore, you know, when you took to nonviolence, you took to it much more definitively than <laughs> Hindus did. So thirdly, and this is probably the reason that I'm spending special time on Abdul Ghaffar Khan for us right now, 
It's the idea that nonviolence has no place in Islam. Let's just do it this way. Uh, off on north side here, there used to be a nice little shop that sold Afghan articles. And if you felt like walking around in one of those beaded hats, you thought you would look good in something like that, people were often in there. Or they're buying exotic presents for their partner or something like that. It was a fun place to hang out in. And I was in there one time. It was, must have been about 1987, I guess, because uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan was still alive. And, you know, the shop owner looked like he was Afghan, so I started to talk to him about Abdul Ghaffar Khan. And he said, is the old man still alive? And he was just practically weeping. It was just very embarrassing right there on north side. But he, you know, he, was, he had such an emotional hold on the people. And then we talked about what we were just talking about, how Islam actually is as adoptable toward nonviolence as almost any other faith. And we will be talking about this again in a little bit when we shift our attention and look at nonviolence in the West. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Judaism, Islam, and Christianity as nonviolent, potentially nonviolent religions. And the guy said to me something which I've never forgotten. He said, you know, there's no one is more Muslim than your Pathan. In other words, Pathans are like mega Muslims. They're, they're hyper, super Muslim. So if, anyone, if Pathans could take to nonviolence, then that is proof positive that it definitely fits in an Islamic context. And the fourth myth, again, is very important for us today in a slightly different way, and that is that nonviolence can be only be used, let's say, I should put this, within a society. That it cannot be organized against or as a substitute for warfare. And uh, I've already mentioned that there are two modalities in which nonviolence is in fact applicable to the large-scale interstate armed conflict situation, otherwise <coughs> known as war. One is called civilian-based defense where you do it yourself and another is called third-party nonviolent intervention. And those are both very important, particularly the latter, because this is a growing edge of nonviolence in the world today. And we'll be talking a lot about that in Tax 164b, which will probably happen next semester. But the fact is that uh, Khan Saab was the first person to raise virtually an army of nonviolent resistors. The, this organization called the Kudai Khidmatgars which means the servants of God. That's the last item in the left-hand column of your ID review sheet. And on the bottom is Khudai Khidmatgar. Khud means God, I guess, in Arabic. Come here. No? Khud? Okay. <laughs> Allah will always work. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think it's a general term for God. I think Khuda is like Persian or Arabic. Yeah, actually, Persian. Probably Persian and Urdu. So, and this is the, the genitive. So these are the servants of God. So the fact is that these people numbered 80,000 uh, thanks to British repression. Classic example of paradox of repression. They were absolutely obedient to their officers, including their – top man, the general, Abdul Ghaffar. They were wearing uniforms. You've seen the picture in the book. And they, in every respect, they were an army except they didn't wear weapons. They didn't carry weapons and they were completely dedicated to nonviolent resistance and, and humanitarian and civilian service. Okay? So that's the point that I hope you take away from this, if nothing else, that uh, just studying this man's career completely busts open four of the most damaging myths about nonviolence. So he was born in 1890 in the village of Utmanshai, which is near Peshawar in, of course, what is now Pakistan. That's a grim part of the story that we'll be getting to. Uh, this province, the Northwest Frontier Province, 
had always been sort of a special border area in many ways. For one thing, it was mostly Islamic. But for another, there was a tribal culture there. And it's like the opposite extreme from South India where it was very protected from external influences because you had the Greeks, the Persians, uh, the Arabs, and it was a heavy Buddhist influence at one point. So it's really these cultures are washing back and forth. And there was a tribal – it's a tribal society and it was very much caught in the violence of what became known to history as the Great Game. The Great Game is not the Cal-Stanford Game in this case. It was the struggle between the British and the Soviets uh, – not, not yet the Soviets, the Russians. The British and the Russians over who was going to control India. India was a big, fat prize and the British got there first. And, you know, colonial powers tend to feel very possessive about possessions. Sometimes that doesn't sound too stupid, but uh, <laughs> I remember reading an account of a, a mystic that I kind of like. She's not exactly my style, but I kind of like her. Her name is St. Rose of Lima and how they defended Peru against the Dutch. There's the Spanish defended Peru against the Dutch with a sense of tremendous righteousness. Like, we conquered this country first. How dare you come in and try to conquer it? You know, I stole it fair and square, that kind of thing. So the British were very uh, uptight about losing India to Russian influence and that the locus of that geographically was the Khyber Pass. In those days, that was the only kind of pass you had. You didn't have a Ural Pass. You didn't have a Continental One Pass. So the only way to get into India was uh, from that direction on land was through the Khyber Pass because the mountains were really, really impassable to the prevailing technologies. You know, the story of Italy is not dissimilar. There's a few passes where Hannibal actually managed to get some elephants through there and that led him to you know, devastate parts of northern Italy. So it was a little bit like that. It's uh, – the Khyber Pass was the gateway to India. When, yeah. Khyber, yeah. Very romantic associations, the Khyber Pass. And because the uh, – in, in – Prior centuries, I mean, prior to the, gate, the Great Game in the 19th century, the Patans had actually served as a kind of protective barrier for the rest of India. But now they're really going to be squeezed in this vice between the two superpowers. And this is something that we've encountered before. Um, and the result was a very, un a very destructive clash between the British determination that they had to hold on to the Khyber Pass or they would lose India. And if they lost India, they would become modern England. They didn't want that to happen. They wanted to remain the – in fact, at in early 20th century, there were 390 million people who were British subjects and 305 million of them were Indian. So this is not just the jewel in the crown. This is also the rim and the little adjusting clasp in the back. It was basically the whole thing. So in order to hold on to it, it was essential that they, that they hold on to the Khyber Pass and a political career could be made or broken in India on the basis of whether or not you were tough enough to overcome the Patans. So on the one hand, you have this intense determination to hold on to that place at all costs. And on the other hand, you have this incredible spirit of freedom among the Afghans or the Patans who absolutely insist on killing one another and not having anyone else kill them. That's, that's what they like to do. So they will – you know, the Russians were unable to do it. And I have a funny feeling that in a couple <coughs> of years, we're going to see our own military expedition there coming to grief as the Taliban slowly retakes the country. And they're doing it partly on that old Patan spirit, which uh, nobody has succeeded in crushing. So these are people who would rather die than lose their freedom. And on the other hand, you have the British who for, for nothing would they give up 
the capacity to dominate these people. So it was an extremely intense confrontation that kept flaring up. Um, okay. And but uh, Abdul Ghaffar's family was, uh, you know, very Patan, but his father, Behram Khan, was apparently something uh, – he was a bit unusual. He was much more dedicated to conversation and solving problems diplomatically and by speech. And he, yeah, he was, o uh, he was okay with revenge, but it wasn't his favorite thing. He was just absolutely, completely dedicated to it. And I guess you would say that in a sense he was rather – his strength came out more in gentleness than in ferocity. Let me put it that way. He, he had a kind of gentle strength which really is the mark of Abdul Ghaffar Khan. It's, I guess at some point if we have time and we can get the equipment together, I'll show you this interview that I have uh, of Bachar Khan when he was uh, almost 90. And you can just see that in his personality. He's this huge towering figure. Not uncommon in that part of India. And, uh, you know, you totally would not want to mess with him. But on the other hand, he totally – he was totally not threatening. And you can see there's a great deal of gentleness. And his start as uh, – well, his father, Bayram Khan – Khan means village ruler, or chieftain. It's a term which I think they had taken over from the Mongols in the 14th century. And he was a – so he had some political authority. He was a ruler and Khan himself is being groomed for this. Uh, but his first experience of political life is doing what Gandhi would later call village uplift. Uh, he decides to go from village to village and ask himself, what do my people need? And what he came up with first and foremost was schools. And that led him immediately into a, a clash. And this is going to kind of be the story of his life now. A clash between the mullahs on the one hand who did not want anybody teaching anything outside of the Quran. It's sort of, they sort of remind me of my barber when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. I, I needed a barber at that time of my life. And <laughs> I had this Italian barber and I, he would always – Ask me, you know, what are you studying in school? And I say, well, I'm learning German and reading all this. I said, why do you bother with all of that? Everything is in Dante, just to read Dante. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the mullahs were sort of like that. Uh, just read the Quran, <laughs> don't mess with anything else. Um, so he's clashing with the mullahs on the one hand, and, you know, he's got to work that out. And on the other hand, he's clashing with the Raj because they don't want him doing anything. They are in charge and they're very nervous about anybody standing up and saying, I have some role to play in my society here. So he's going to be he, – in the end, he is, he's going to live for 90 years. He's going to spend 52 of those 90 years in prison, mostly not at the hands of the British. In fact, when I got caught up in his story is when he was brought into house arrest, I think. Again, he was already a very old man in the early <coughs> 1980s and uh, uh, we decided to put together a group to nominate him for the Nobel Prize. He had already won a very coveted award in 1962. He was Amnesty International's Prisoner of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if I don't ever get the Nobel, at least I'll be Prisoner of the Year at some point. <laughs> but we, won we nominated him twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. Which, which he didn't get, which I think means that he was a very important figure in the world of peace development. Because if you're really very important, they, no one will give you a prize. They, did, they didn't give it to Gandhi and so they didn't give it to him. So, but he gets involved in village uplift and it primarily takes the form of education. He wants to start schools. And another very important thing to him was the uplift of women. And that would be, <coughs> for the rest of his life, one of his main uh, preoccupations. In 1925, when he had heard of Gandhi but had not yet met him, he founded a newspaper called the Pashtun, which is the name of the people and the language. And that ran, I think, until it was snuffed out by the, the Pakistani regime in 1947. And so you see he's running on a parallel track 
to Gandhi. He gets very interested in constructive program. In fact, uh, where is that? In 1948, he took the oath of allegiance to Pakistan. We'll, we're going to get around to the circumstances that led up to that in a little bit. Uh, he said, there is no advantage in destruction. There is advantage only in construction. I want to tell you categorically, I will not support anybody in destruction. If any constructive program is before you, if you want to do something constructive for our people – he's talking to the government of Pakistan – if you want to do something constructive for our people, not in theory but in practice – there's another very Gandhian element here – I declare before this house – there's a new house in the Pakistan House of Parliament – that I and my people are at your service. So he had very – though he was a born fighter, like most Patans, he knew how to make his own rifle at age 12. But he was, like Gandhi by this time in his life, completely dedicated to constructive action. And that's how it all started. Now, in Calcutta in 1928, there was a, a Congress meeting, uh, Indian National Congress, and a parallel meeting of the Muslim League. See, by this time, the two peoples are not cooperating very much. And uh, the Muslim League meeting was sort of like a disaster. It was sort of like a typical peace movement meeting. Everybody was squabbling. <laughs> Only uh, in this case, they were pulling out knives and things like that. And uh, Khan got – Camilla? 28. 1928. Am I going too fast? Okay. So Bajra Khan got uh, kind of fed up with that meeting and he wandered on over to the Indian National Congress. You know, was by this was the only show in town if you weren't going to be in the Muslim League. And uh, he saw a remarkable thing. Gandhi was up on the podium and somebody in the audience was heckling him and Gandhi was having the time of his life. He was chuckling. He was loving it. At no point did he stop saying what he wanted to say, but at no point did he get annoyed by the person heckling him. That little vignette of just seeing him under pressure not be rattled immediately attracted Khan's admiration. He went back – let's see if I think this would be page – I think. <coughs> yeah, page, this would be page 106 and 107 in the book that you just finished. Uh, he went back to his own conference and told the president privately that he thought the movement would be stronger if its leadership embodied a little more tolerance and self-restraint. Of course, coming from a Pathan, this is not the expected message. So the president thundered at him, so the wild Pathans have come to teach us about, con about tolerance. And a Khan left the conference and went home. But this idea of Gandhi being able to face that kind of pressure and not even f have a feeling of unkindness in him, that really stayed with him. In a very short time, the two became extremely close. Uh, so much so that in a few years, his own people would call him the frontier Gandhi. And he would be constantly saying, "Don't there's only one Gandhi. Don't call me the anything Gandhi. Gandhi is Gandhi. I'm Abdul Ghaffar Khan. And um, he visited uh, – stayed in Gandhi's ashram quite a bit. You've seen these beautiful photos of the two of them. And on one occasion, he wanted to go and give a speech which would have content that the British would regard as seditious. And Gandhi asked him not to do it. But then Gandhi himself was arrested and with him off the scene for a while, not having fresh input, he decided to go and give the speech and he was arrested. Uh, in Delhi, I guess in early 1929. But he had been involved in the Khilafat struggle and he had been involved in the Rauladak Satyagraha from the Northwest frontier earlier on. And now the two of them really joined forces. And during the Salt Satyagraha, uh, where the Northwest frontier, you couldn't make salt, right? It's just all these mountains and stuff. But they were involved in the uprising and they, this is when that episode 
in the Kisa Kawani Bazaar takes place, page 122 following. And I just want to read you part of it. I know you've just finished reading it, but <laughs> I just want to read you part of it because you will never again entertain myth number one once you've read this description. And we owe this to uh, Gene Sharp, by the way, he's the one who found the documents that had the description of this episode. And this is going to be a just about as destructive and probably in the end more brutal, more dehumanized than the Jolly and Wallabog massacre had been. I don't, we don't have the numbers on exactly how many people got killed and wounded, but we, you're talking about charging into a crowd of people in, with an armored car and just you know crushing people. Um, so there is a standoff between the crowd of protesters in this bazaar and the British police who are offering, uh, ordering them to leave. At about half past 11, people try to persuade the crowd to disperse and, to, and dis persuade the authorities to remove the troops and the armored cars. The crowds were willing to disperse if they were allowed to remove the dead and the injured and if the armored cars and the troops were removed, but the authorities refused. The result was that people did not disperse and were prepared to receive the bullets and lay down their lives. A second firing began and lasted on and off for more than three hours. And imagine, here's this crowd of people not resisting. In fact, there's a case of a young Sikh boy who came and stood in front of a soldier, opened his shirt and said, go ahead, shoot me, and he did. They killed him instantly. And um, the state of things continued from 11 until 5 o'clock in the evening. When the number of corpses between became too many, the ambulance cars of the government took them away and, and burned them. So, you know, once again, this inability to respect people's religious sensibilities. And the result of this was that up until that point, the Kudai Kidmat guards had been, I think, something like two or 3,000. They immediately became 80,000. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, before uh, partition and independence, the Kudai Kidmatgars were more or less just systematically rounded up and crushed and their offices were burned. And it, it was really basically, as a movement, it was basically stamped out by the British. And then when partition came, uh, the question was, here are these people who had f died and bled for independence. Would they go with India or with Pakistan? And Lord Irwin's plan had always been, and the, the later Viceroy Mountbatten definitely stood by that, that every region would have uh, – first of all, if there was a majority Muslim population, the region would be part of Pakistan. If the majority Hindu would be part of India, that's what led to this horrendous wrenching apart of peoples who had lived together you know, forever. But in, in the case of the Northwest frontier, although they were more than 90 percent Muslim, because they, had, they were a part of the Congress party and there was a referendum. And uh, the first referendum – there were two – the first referendum, the people voted almost unanimously to go with India. But Jinnah would not hear of it. And one thing and another, in the second referendum, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who was not in prison, strangely enough, at that moment, made a decision that they should boycott it. So the Kudai Khidmat Guards and their followers basically didn't vote. And then it went nine to one in favor of joining Pakistan. And it was a very bitter moment for Khan, who had been totally against the partition with every breath. That's why the Pakistanis didn't trust him, why Jinnah didn't trust him. And so he, he, he wired to Gandhi and Nehru and all the others and said, you have thrown us to the wolves. And in fact, uh, one of the biographies of his life is just that, thrown to the wolves. <coughs> it's kind of hard to, you know, exactly what else to pick out from his life. Let me say a little bit more about the significance of the Kudai Kidmatgars. They 
there, what they used to do is when there wasn't a conflict going on, they would devote themselves to service. So they were doing, in this case now quite deliberately, they were building what Gandhi had called Shanti Sena. Sena means army and Shanti, of course, as you know from being in Berkeley, Shanti means peace. So this is a peace army. Gandhi's plan was that in every uh, district there be an army of volunteers, army only in the sense of you know, a big group of volunteers, preferably from the district but not necessarily, and that they would be there for service. That was their main role. Whatever you needed, they would do. And incidentally, this would be also carried out in a different way in Sri Lanka <coughs> where there is a very important movement still going on called Sarvodaya, a Gandhian term meaning the uplift of everybody. Sarva is everybody. Ud means up and Aya means going. So let's all get up, this is Sarvodaya or uplift of all. And that's been one of the few things that's been holding Sri Lanka together. It, it's a huge movement started by a man named Dr. A.T. Aryaratne who was you know, very close to Gandhi in principle but turned this thing into uh, – a gave a sort of non-Hindu format in Sri Lanka. So the Shanti Sena was supposed to be there providing services and especially in cases of incipient conflict and especially in cases of communal conflict which could flare up very, very quickly and then you get hideously destructive. They were supposed to provide good offices between the two parties. So the way this often would work is a rumor would get started and where there's anxiety, rumors can get started very quickly, get out of proportion. Someone would come running in. Oh my God, did you hear what's happening in the next village? They're slaughtering all the Hindus. And uh, so you go out there to investigate and you find that a cow got run over or something like that. And so if you're – as a trusted third party, you see, you can come back and say, hey, no, cool it, don't worry. It's not what you think. So they can keep a damper on conflict, keep these communal hatreds from flaring up. So it's like there are three stages. When nothing is going on, you do service and you build trust and confidence. When something is starting to go on, you do what's called good offices or uh, kind of go-betweenage. And when something is happening, when it has flared up, in the last analysis, what you're supposed to do if you're a good Shanti Sainik is to get in between the parties and say, okay, if you're going to shoot, you'll hit us. And uh, that sounds like a dangerous vocation and uh, pro you know, probably it is. But as a matter of fact, the psychology of conflict is such that it, when you get into that polarization where it's me against you, you see nothing but against. And you can't even see anybody else. Now when a third party comes in and says, I'm neither, quote, me nor, quote, you, there's a whole other world that's opened up. And that can be enough sometimes to diffuse the polarization and the tensions that are leading up to the violence. Now, uh, we actually witnessed something like that on a somewhat smaller scale, believe it or not, on the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, we didn't have military affairs in those days. We had something called uh, re ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps. If something is doing harmful, destructive work, the solution is change its name. You know, we have the School of America has got changed to the Western Hemisphere into the security cooperation, blah, blah. They're doing exactly the same thing. But at those days anyway, they called it the ROTC and they had a little building called Callahan Hall, which is now a huge generator, I think. But in those days it was this wooden building with lots of rifles inside. People would come out in brown uniforms every now and then and march around and go back. But the 70s was very anti-militarist on this campus. Also some other parts of the world I think dotted around here and there. But definitely Berkeley campus, it was not fun to be in the ROTC 
in the early 70s. And this a big group of very angry students is coming down to Callahan Hall, picking up rocks and getting ready to trash the building, which could you do is basically glass and wood. They could have done it. And inside the building are the ROTC cadets with their M1 rifles thinking, you know, we're supposed to defend the building. We get to do it now for real, not just training anymore. And it could have been very ugly. Uh, in fact, it was already sort of <laughs> ugly <laughs> in a way. But there was a little organization that existed for about a month, I think. It was called Berkeley Students for Peace. And they trotted on down there when they heard about this. And they stood in between and they said to the students, if you throw stones, you'll hit us. And in inherently, they said to the ROTC students, if you shoot, you'll, you'll, you'll kill us. I don't think they were seriously intending to shoot at them. But anyway, the, f the thing is that they completely stopped that conflict. They were very small in number, armed with nothing, but they did what's called interposition. Sometimes we call it interpositioning to make it sound a little bit more formal. And this is sort of the last ditch uh, service that Ashanti Sena is supposed to provide. So first it's you know, humanitarian and other services. Second, it's conflict reduction and uh, heading off of conflict. And finally, if it's too late and it's a conflict is going on, you make yourself into a willing victim and that <coughs> completely changes the psychodynamics of the situation. Now it has been put to test historically in a few cases. There was a, a riot at the University of Beijing in the 70s where this worked. And the, on the largest scale, it was probably the case of the Western Sahara where they actually headed off a civil war between the government and the Polisario Front. You know, the two forces were marching on one another. It was going to be a bloody confrontation. And ladies with baby carriages and just or ordinary people just got out and stood in between and basically stopped it. So it's a very powerful mechanism. Of course, by itself, this is only – okay, you use the technical terms here – that the field has developed, this is a form of peacekeeping, which is an emergency operation. In order for it to endure, though, you have to go on to peacemaking, which can be one word, and ultimately to peace building, which means – well, peace, peacemaking is – hold on, let me get this written down. Peacemaking is where you sit the two sides down at the table to talk and they try to resolve their conflict. Peace building is where you look at the underlying conditions that caused the conflict in the first place. So it's economic, social, political, whatever they were. So uh, these three mechanisms have grown out of Gandhi's concept of Ashanti Sena, which really developed pretty early in his mind, and he tri which he tried to build in India. But he finally said, look, I, I'm spread too thin already. I don't have the time or the heart to do this. And actually the story of that formal organization called the Shanti Sena in India is not a brilliant, dramatic success. There were two conflicts which they tried to intervene in and really weren't able to get anywhere. And so like a number of other things, it failed in India, but it was picked up somewhere else. And the fact – yeah, John? Yeah, suppose you could call the fact that it failed in India and was picked up elsewhere, you could call that work versus work. Because it looks – you know, if you look at the history of the Shanti Sena, so-called, it's a history of failure. But in the meantime, the idea <laughs> is percolating out through the world and you the UN tries to pick it up in a way and it goes on and on. I think today – you probably have guessed this already, but I think this is the cutting edge of anti-war work, peace development in the world. And that's why I work with an organization which was at the peace boat yesterday called the, Sh the Shanti Sena, called the no Nonviolent Peace Force. And they have 90 member organizations. We talk about it in some detail next semester. And 
They're trying to take this idea of interposition and make it global. Uh, it, of course, it would cost a lot. It would probably cost as much as one F-16 fighter to turn this into a worldwide <laughs> organization. So you can't afford that kind of money. Okay, so I got a little carried away. But uh, part, part of I – I think that's okay though. A part of the significance of Abdul Ghaffar Khan is that he was the first to actually outfit a whole army and have it operate with uniforms, obedience, everything that an army had, music, you know, songs, everything. Probably much better music <laughs> than most of the armies that I've ever heard. Umpa, umpa. Uh, and <laughs> everything but violence. And it became extremely I stirring the degree to which they were able to carry out nonviolent resistance. There's a story of uh, one Pathan coming into the Kudai Kidmatgar office and very dramatically taking off his shirt and turning around and showing he has these big welts on his back. He's been severely beaten by the police and he says, he says this has never happened in the history of the Pathans. The Pathans give blows. They do not receive them. I'm doing it only for you. He's speaking to Abdul Ghaffar Khan. And Gandhi knew that part of their commitment was their loyalty to him. Now just recently, after decades of neglect, this story is being rediscovered. And a Bengali woman named Mukulika Banerjee, who is an anthropologist, went to the Patan territories. I still say Patan. I'm a little bit – because I worked on this book a lot. It kind of got into my head. But you, when I say Patan, you should hear Pakhtun. Okay. She went into those territories and tried to collect the people who had been Kudai Kidmatgars. In some cases, they were you know, into Alzheimer's already. But she got them together and interviewed them. And she asked them questions like, what made you follow Abdul Ghaffar Khan? It was completely – in a way, it was completely against your culture. Though in a way, it was just a slight <coughs> refocusing of what that culture had been about. And most often they said it was because of his spirituality. We could sense his stature and we knew that he was a real leader and we would follow him anywhere. At the same time, however, while this is very stirring and very uh, inspiring, there's a weakness there, a potential weakness. And Gandhi knew that these people were not dedicated to principled nonviolence uh, at a depth which would, really <coughs> which would really carry on. So in 1930, he, ex he cheerfully accepted an invitation from Abdul Ghaffar Khan to tour the Northwest Provinces and speak to those people. And basically what he told them is, you guys, it's, you know, it's just brilliant. It's great what you're doing, but this is just the beginning. And you, th what I'm seeing from you now is like nonviolence of the weak. I want you to take this into your heart and make it nonviolence of the strong or else go back to your house and pick up your rifle and it, you know, do what you feel is the right thing to do. So you know, he, did, he had no objection, of course, to their following Abdul Ghaffar Khan. They played a key role in the freedom struggle because while the British were losing it in one way at the Darsan assault towns during the Salt March, they were losing it in another way but a more costly way for India in the northwest frontier because they, they did the worst that they were capable of and it was not holding these people down. Well, the question is to what extent did they really assimilate it and believe this and to what extent were they just so dedicated to Khan Saab that they were following him and doing what he suggested? You know, I think it's sort of in between. It's sort of in between in the following two respects. They were intrigued by that new definition of courage. I think there was something about that that really appealed to them. So they felt really – that guy who went in and showed his back and said, you know, we Patans have never done this before. I think there was a part of him that felt really good about it. 
And when you survey uh, different peoples in the world today who have tried nonviolence in one way or another, they will say uh, – like the Filipinos will say, we, this is Filipino style. And the Poles in Solidarność, they said, we did it because we were Polish. In other words, it's part of people's self-image, deeply buried in them sometimes, that they are a courageous, nonviolent people. And that must have appealed to the Patans very deeply. But they didn't quite grok it. You know, they didn't quite understand. You don't get it overnight what nonviolence really is. Uh, and so th what carried them the rest of the way was just the tremendous appeal of Abdul Ghaffar Khan himself and their loyalty. What would have uh, – I think if they had had the time to connect up with his constructive program, then it really could have built out and become something permanent and very deep inside of them. But alas, that was not to be the case because, you know, he's uh, Khan spends most of his time in prison. And when he's in prison, things tend to fall apart. And uh, that – so that it was a limited success, but it's like a model success for the rest of the world because it shows you and he'll say, okay, I told you what I was going to tell you. I told you and now I'm going to tell you that I told you. Okay, and then we'll be finished. It shows you that the, the, the British were not a weak opponent. They dragged people by the heels. They threw them in wells. They, they ordered a Pathan to strip in public and he said, I am a Muslim. This will never happen. And they, they just beat him senseless. They, as you know, they shot people down in cold blood. They were – they were terrified of serving in the Northwest frontier for very good reasons. And that terror turned into extreme violence and uninhibited violence. And this violence was the final sanction that lay behind the whole imperial domination. Even when you could so cleverly disguise it and organize it that it didn't come out, that was the final recourse. It's what we call in political science the ultima ratio regum. The final recourse of rulers is the exertion of violence. And it came out. So the British were – nonviolence did not work in India because the British were polite. That's, that's the point. That's myth number one. Secondly, that you don't have to be polite yourself <laughs> to be nonviolent. You really just have to be courageous and have some sense of principle and some other things that we discussed. It works perfectly well in Islam. Uh, Gandhi – I'm sorry, uh, even I'm getting them confused now. Abdul Ghaffar Khan said, I am going to give you such a weapon. He was now ta talking to his own people in the early stage of building up the Khudai Khidmatgars. I'm going to give you such a weapon that the police and the army will not be able to stand against it. It was the weapon of the Prophet, capital P, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But you are not aware of it. That weapon is patience and righteousness. No power on earth can stand against it. So he felt that he was operating in a strictly Islamic concept context and he was being, as my friend said on Euclid Avenue, the most Muslim, the most Muslim of Muslims. Yeah. And finally, as I've been stressing that um, – it is wrong to say, and even Kenneth Boulding said that nonviolence is very good for offense, but it's not very good for defense. He was given to sort of a wry <coughs> humor at times, Kenneth Boulding was. But uh, there are many political scientists who will be aware of the fact that there have been class uprisings like the uprising against British rule in India or against racism in America, but they have no idea and don't believe that it can be used in international conflict. Well, given what we've actually experienced, there's no reason to disbelieve that that can, that that can be done. Okay. Well, as predicted, uh, I, think, I think I'm going to stop now in terms of adding any new material. And let's just open it up and see if we want to maybe list off the basic concepts that we've covered or just work from the review sheet. Or anyway, Rami, I know you had a question a while back that we didn't get her answer. So let's start there. Okay. So we were talking about nonviolent coercion. 
Yeah. And how do you know when to enter the state? When, 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 how do you know that the only way to get a, your opponent to understand uh -huh. what, what your, your position is by nonviolent coercion or action? Um, I think nonviolent coercion, the way I'm going to interpret the word anyway, it's, it's used slightly differently by different people. I think I'm going to put this in the category of more or less forcing someone to do something by s social pressure, by some kind of external pressure rather than persuasion. And I think what I would say is that it's a matter of timing. If you have time to persuade, try to persuade. But in the real world – I see you, Joy. I'll get to you in a second. In the real world – and I'm putting real in quotes because you know the world is not real. <laughs> Quantum scientists have proven that over and over again. But these, for the time being, in the real world, windows of opportunity come up and you have to use them. You know, the civil rights movement was a window of opportunity. Black soldiers just come back from World War II. Racism had been given a very, very bad reputation by Hitler and they had a window of opportunity. They've been waiting for hundreds of years and they had to do what they, what they could do then and not wait anymore. This is – I'm kind of paraphrasing Martin Luther King's famous letter from Birmingham jail. And I guess the example I used before was uh, the overthrow of Pinochet in Chile. Uh, they had just one window there where they could get their forces together. They f he made two big mistakes, Pinochet did. He let them use television for 15 minutes a day and that was all it took to get their message out. He had the other 23 hours and 45 minutes, but apparently lots of lying is not as powerful as a little bit of truth. And they built up that whole movement and the second mistake was he had to allow them to do a plebiscite and they voted him out. I, you know, I seriously doubt that to this day he was for one minute ever persuaded that he did wrong to torture all those people. And there were plenty of people around him who would shake his hand and say, you know, Pinochet, Pinochet. We'll see this in the film in 164B. So the choice it realistically was either force him out or, or get nowhere, just have him continue being a dictator. So it's at that point where nonviolent coercion comes into the picture. It's nonviolent because you're not forcing him out at gunpoint. You're forcing him out by constitutional means. But it's definitely not the same as persuasion. If he had his chance, if he wasn't so old and is now being indicted by a Spanish court thanks to international law, I assure you he would come back with the same – Caudillismo and subjugate Chile all over again, just the same. So what are we saying? I guess we're, you know, persuasion is ideal because it's going to be permanent. Uh, but when you're talking about large groups of people and the opportunism that has to come in in social movements, sometimes you cannot persuade your opponent. The next best thing is to compel their behavior through external – force of some kind or another. Uh, and the worst thing to do is to just pick up their weapons and fight against them within their own terms. Okay, Joy. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Well, I apologize for the fact that there's a lot of material. Uh, I wanted there to be five courses on nonviolence, but they didn't give them to me. So it has to get kind of crammed down. And not just the UC Berkeley problem, but as you know, it's, uh, it's way, way out of – it's asymmetrical. Destructive energy is studied till the cows come home. You know, it's been going at this for centuries. But constructive energy, which we need, which is an infinitely more important, we're just – the human race is just starting to catch on. So this is kind of a big philosophical apology for having so much material in the course and so many books. Can't be helped. We just need to do it. Um, I really – I think I'm sort of at a loss to tell you how to determine what's important and what isn't. I think you should try to psych me out. Um, 
uh, if, if worse comes to worse and you go on a hunger strike, whatever it takes. <laughs> no, no, I'm, only, I'm only kidding about that part. I didn't want anyone to lose any calories over this. Um, but I think I, – I hope and expect it's something that you can build up just by you know, listening to the way we've been going through the material. I've been constantly pulling out what I think is important, like I just did here. So I'm not going to expect you to remember the name of Abdul Ghaffar Khan's father. You don't have to remember anything about his two wives, though it's a very sad, very romantic story if that happens to amuse you. But the, the important thing about his life is that it gives the lie to these four myths and you should know in some detail how he did it. So you're not just going to say he proved that nonviolence works against a ruthless opponent. But then you go on to say, look at what the British police did at the Kisa Kahani Bazaar in 1930 in Peshawar where they – and you know, list off as many of the gruesome details as you can stomach. In other words, know the principles and have some concrete detail to put to those principles. That's how I would study. Now there are going to be – did you guys announce it already? There, okay, there are going to be review sessions <coughs> with, with our intrepid readers who are very, very good at this stuff. Uh, and also, I think people have often found it helpful to get together in groups. So it's a little bit like uh, studying for your law degree, which some of you will eventually be doing, I suspect. Uh, I don't know why it works so well that way, but it's always been the case that people get together in Milano's or Nefeli's or one of the – how many coffee shops are there in Berkeley? It looks like we have at least 190 of them. Let's get together in one of those, together in groups, and just talk about this stuff. Uh, beyond that, I really don't know what to suggest. However, I can say this by way of mitigation. And I think I've mentioned this before, but if you do not so great on the midterm and inshallah you do very, very well on the final, the midterm grade does not count – it does not really count. It doesn't count. That's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't count. So, <laughs> so if, if you get a C in the midterm and an A on the final, just to simplify, uh, we're not going to give you a B for your exam grade and then make that half the grade, weigh that against the paper grade. It'll be more like a B plus or an A minus. So I understand that it's partly you have to figure out how – I think, if that's the term <laughs> that I should be using and what I'm really asking for. And that's why after the, the Tuesday after the midterm, we'll have a very detailed diagnostic where I'll tell you. I'm also going to point uh, – we'll take some time either Tuesday, which will be completely dedicated to review, or today if we run out of questions. And I will tell you in detail, point for point, how to answer an ID. Because that's important because if you go on and on and on, you won't have time for your essay questions. If you don't give enough, of course, it also won't work. Okay? Any other questions either about the mechanics or somewhat preferably the content of the course? Julia. Um, in that part of the video that um, was mostly about like, science and scientific terms that was really long, uh -huh. a lot of it – I mean, how much – Okay. What do I want you to know about science? Well, it, what I want you to know about it is everything. What I am going to uh, really want you to know for the exam is only to know that the fifth big myth and the sixth, namely that science shows that nonviolence is impossible and history shows that nonviolence is impossible, both of those are totally wrong. That in fact, when you do science intelligently, as some scientists do, <laughs> you, uh, you can actually get a tremendous amount of support for the basic principles that we need to have to understand how nonviolence would work. And the three that I picked out were, first of all, that we're built to empathize with one another and that when we – however we behave, not just behave, but however we – Whatever our mental state is influences the mental states of others. And thirdly and finally, that this can be changed through culture, through education. Those – I th think those three big facts. 
Now, uh, you know, you're going to have people come up to you and say, no, but the world consists of material objects <coughs> and tables and chairs. How, what's, what's this living power all about? You sit them down and say, hey, I hate to be the one to break it to you, buddy, but uh, the world does not consist of physical objects, tables and chairs. It consists of probability waves in an energy field or something like that. Just, you know, don't look at me. I was a comparative literature person. So I think it's extremely helpful to know, but I'm not going to insist that you know it in much detail uh, for the midterm or the final exam. That's the answer. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the work versus work. Yes. Can you explain yes, I can explain work versus work, but I would rather some other people explain it. How, wh what is that concept there? And why is it important? John? And since you brought it up earlier. <laughs> oh, I always will correct you if you that's my job description. Yeah. But the word that is not equivalent to work to be success. So is it God like with solving God? And the reason that's so important for us to know about, I mean, aside from its obvious interest, think of going back to your co-op or wherever you live and uh, people saying, but look, you know, nonviolence doesn't work. Look what happened to the students in Beijing. You know, look what happened at the salt march. It doesn't work. Yeah. Good, good. Violence sometimes works, but never actually works. Yes. <coughs> and nonviolence sometimes works, but always works. Yes. I actually think that if I do get the Nobel Prize, it'll be for that one sentence. <laughs> this is this is my main contribution to human civilization. Uh, there's uh, one, there's another wrinkle to that, and that is when v when violence doesn't quote work. You know, uh, there was a guy in San Francisco a few years ago who uh, stepped up to somebody in his car and pointed a gun at him, opened the door, said, get out, leave the keys in the ignition and get out. And the driver got out of the car and said, hi, my name is Bill. I don't think we've met. And the, the, the next thing he knew, the poor carjacker was flummoxed and he couldn't carry out his plan. So the violence didn't work. Or to take a rather more painful example, you know, we went into Iraq to bring them democracy. We've now killed about 650,000 people and we still don't have democracy. It didn't work. But nobody, I promise you, nobody is going to go back to Congress unless it be Lynn Woolsey, my representative from Marin and Sonoma. She's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not just because she's my representative, but it, you know, I, I love her. She may well go in there and say, this gentleman, and most of the House is gentlemen, or men anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she will say, gentlemen, this proves that violence doesn't work. Nobody, nobody says that. But you have one episode of nonviolence not working, and they say, aha, I, sh I told you, nonviolence doesn't work. So that's why it's critically important to be a little bit more astute about that. We, we're not going to say that nonviolence always, quote, works because sometimes, as John was just telling us, it does not. But it always does work. It does some good work on the situation. Now, the last thing that uh, you pointed out, John, which I really think is neat, is that very often it accomplishes something that you didn't even have in mind. And very often what it accomplishes is much better than what you had in mind. Most of those people at the Darsana raid, they were not saying this is going to get the British out of India. This is going to show what Western civilization is doing here in our country. But that's exactly what it accomplished. And you know my famous uh, example of the grain bag story? Have you, ever read that? you want to tell us what happened? 
because you read it in my book, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, um, it, it, I think that it has something to do with, um, how, uh, the, um, I think it was during Korea? Yeah, during well, it was during the Korean conflict. Yep. Yeah, during the Korean conflict, a bunch of people were sent in, um, mm -hmm. uh, grain bags to the, um, U.S. Congress or To the president, like actually. To the president himself. Mm -hmm. And, um, show that you wanted to uh, give the people of Korea food, not bombs. Yeah, it was actually the Chinese. There was, a, there was a critical, horrendous famine going on in China. And at that point in time, we had a huge food surplus in the U.S. This went over very big in Pax 10 yesterday, so I thought I'd trot it out again for you guys. Um, you, there used to be something called newsreels. Before there were iPods and things like that, cell phones. I got my first text message last week. I was really <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> but there used to be newsreels. You'd go in the theater and you'd sit there, and before the film came that you had paid to watch, you'd hear da 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 and this pathé news, and they would give you like 10 minutes maybe of newsreel footage. And one of the things that they were showing over and over again was destroying food in America because there was such a surplus that it was driving the prices too low. So there were like mountains of potatoes were being burned and millions of gallons of milk were being dumped into the rivers. And some genius who really should get the Nobel Prize was thinking, we have too much food. The Chinese don't have enough. Aha! <laughs> he had what's called in German ein aha Erlebnis. <laughs> and he said, we give some of our food to the Chinese, which will have, first of all, will keep them from dying of starvation. That's nice. But also will we'll stop – they we, you know, they were our biggest enemy at that time outside of Russia. So 35,000 Americans, including your humble servant, sent these little miniature game grain bags to the White House. And we sat listening by our radios. You know, they had something called radios, you know, the big wooden boxes. You listen to them and nothing. You know, the War rages on, no change, nothing. So you could easily conclude that it did not work. But then there came the Freedom of Information <coughs> Act. Remember the Freedom of Information Act? I'm sure it's dead by now. But they proved they, – they discovered that Eisenhower was having a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Chiefs were arguing that you should go across the Yalu River and start bombing mainland China. But he did not want to. And he asked his aide how many of those grain bags had come in. And the aide said it was 35,000. And he got up and he said, 35,000 Americans are asking me to start feeding the Chinese. This is hardly the time to be bombing them. End of conversation. So basically, m I <laughs> and 34,999 other people <laughs> basically prevented World War III. I mean, that's the reason we're all here today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That is some appreciation. It's about time. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, you know, this is perhaps a slight exaggeration about the World War III part, but uh, the fact is we were not aiming. We had no idea that the Joint Chiefs were prodding the President to bomb China at that time. So what it accomplished was far greater than even what we had set out to do, which we failed to accomplish. Now, that's my favorite example, partly, of course, because of my signal role <laughs> in this example. But it's – you know, remember back the very first meeting that we had together? I was talking, think about positive energy, negative energy. When you decide to use positive energy, it does positive work and vice versa. It's Eli. Yes, please do that. Thanks to global warming, we can mostly meet outdoors anyway.
it looks like you better have two of them, Laura. <laughs> Can you do that? No, nothing is going to get everybody, I can tell you. <laughs> it, we'll try and get you some help if, if you want to have two sections. We'll, we'll sort of find somebody who can help you. Probably will. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Anything else? What has what has particularly intrigued you or or puzzled you about the concept of nonviolence? Kevin. Um, well, let's put it this way. Shanti Sena could be used for civilian-based defense or for a kind of third-party nonviolent intervention. The way Gandhi originally conceived of it, see, he was not, except for the potential Japanese invasion through Burma, he was really not directly working on the question of war. So he thought of his Shanti Senas as mostly local phenomena. But actually, given today's world where national boundaries are becoming more porous and less significant, it really – the concept has become any third party intervening at any scale. So there, there's one, one of the books that describes this is called Nonviolent Intervention Across Borders. But it doesn't really matter all that much whether you're going across a border into a foreign territory of some kind or you're just interposing yourself between two groups. So. It really – so the way he was thinking of Ashanti Sena is sort of in between civilian-based defense, uh, third-party nonviolent intervention and could break either way. Good. Okay, uh, Camilla. Um, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Like okay. It's underlying it and that means that you can bring it in whenever you want to and it means that there probably will be – like as you see on your list, there may be one or two questions directly aimed at that. Like what is the Gita theory of action? Who was Arjuna? Uh, even Arjuna couldn't figure that one out. Uh, and I guess you know, terms like karma, we may have that in the IDs. But I think the best way to think about it is um, – you can really understand where Gandhi is coming from only if you know that background. And then you can bring it in as you find useful. Okay, everybody, have a good weekend. Not too much fun though. Lots of studying. <laughs> See you Monday.